of the Illinois Humanities funded in part by that grant. Um, called the Real Life Lorax by National Geographic and Einstein of the Treetops by Wall Street Journal, Meg Lohman is an author, explorer, scientist, Arbonaut, Arbonaut translation, treetop explorer, Fulbright scholar, and change agent conservation. She has devoted over four decades to exploration and research on treetop secrets as one of the first pioneers to launch canopy science and as a museum leader. Lohman has published 10 books and over 200 peer reviewed publications and holds a BA in biology, a master of science in ecology, a PhD in botany and executive management from Tuck School of Business. She has received myriad prizes, including the Margaret Douglas Medal by Garden Club of America, Roy Chapman Andrews Distinguished Explorer Award, Kilby Laureate, Odom Award for Excellence in Education by Ecological Society of America, and Lowell Thomas Medal by the Explorers Club. Her recent projects included creating a UNESCO World Heritage Forest Site in Malaysia and partnering with Ethiopia's Coptic priests to save their last 5% remaining church forests. Canopy Mag uses books and written word to share her art with others. Her latest book, The Arbor Knot, is a dynamic memoir of a girl tree climber. She built the walkway in Mayaka State Park outside of Sarasota to share her treetops with families and children. And she is fundraising to save the 10 most endangered forests of the world. Um, so uh, Matt, it's quite a, quite a uh, resume you have there. <laughs> uh, it's a great honor to host you. Um, on staff here at Westchester Public Library, um, we have several fans of your book, The Argonaut. And just to let everybody know, um, one lucky audience member tonight is going to be given a, a free brand new copy of the book. So uh, without further ado, um, take it away, Meg, and I'll reappear after your talk for the Q&A, which I'm really looking forward to. Uh, thank you, Patrick. I'm just really thrilled to be here and welcome to everybody who might uh, enjoy hearing a little bit about some tropical hot forests compared to maybe where you are up there in Illinois. And uh, this is a real privilege. So I will share my screen if I can and check with Patrick to make sure that's gonna happen. And then we can talk about a few more things. So hopefully that's up right now. And um, so yes, I am a girl tree climber. My story is pretty humble and ordinary, but I hope that I can influence girls in science and other people in science. I'm the mother of two boys, so I need to influence boys as well. But I think right now we need a lot of people involved in saving the forests of the world because they are so, so, so endangered. And I hope my book will contribute to that. So with that, um, I'm going to just tell a little bit about my life and how it's intertwined with the book. But I was a really geek child. Here I am in fifth grade with my wildflower collection that I took to the New York State Science Fair as the only girl with about 499 boys and uh, most of them doing volcano explosion experiments. And there I was with these flowers that I had pressed and collected and hidden under my bed and done these crazy things to become this little girl naturalist. And I think to myself, you know, most scientists seem to start life as collectors, which is kind of interesting. And I do talk about my childhood at the beginning of my book. And I'm embarrassed, to be honest, because I was such a geek. And all of my friends were doing, you know, uh, nail polish or sleepovers. And I was getting up at 6am to go bird watching or doing all these things like collecting wildflowers. But it does illustrate how passion has so much to do with how kids evolve. And I try to talk to school children everywhere. I do a lot of school talks every week to explain, you know what, you need to follow your passion. And that's really important. Um, this is where I grew up. 
uh, rural upstate New York where not too much was happening. Of course, in my day, no computers, uh, no cell phones. And in a little tiny town like mine, there were no theaters or any other exciting things. But I had all these amazing trees that changed color every autumn. And it was extraordinary that these leaves were green for six months and then they became red and yellow. And I guess it led me on this obsession with leaves and um, turned me into some sort of tree scientist in the end. Um, my family was very rural. My grandfather during the prohibition turned the corn on the family farm into whiskey and I guess paid the bills that way. So I'm laughing because there were no scientists in my family, no role models for me, but at the same time, somehow I got really infatuated with trees. And I guess I'm the first scientist from my side of the family um, in the last 200 years that was excited about doing science. So any family, any person, any kid who is interested in science, I encourage you to follow your passion. Um, so my life was full of amazing experiences. I ended up, of course, pursuing this life as an arbornaut. You know, astronauts go to outer space, aquanauts go undersea, but arbornaut is the technical term for people who explore the treetops. So here are lots of pictures of me in the canopy with colleagues, everything from ropes and harnesses to canopy walkways to hot air balloons to daytime studies and nighttime studies and all of it leading us to finally figure out the secrets of trees, which is so, so important. And guess what? One of the first things I discovered with my little tiny slingshot, putting a rope over a branch and climbing up the tree with my homemade harness and all of my borrowed pieces of hardware from the Mountaineering Club, guess what? 50% of species on the land live in the tops of trees. This is extraordinary. And yet we estimate that probably less than 10% of them have ever been discovered. Everything from dogwoods, which you have in Illinois, the flowers and fruits of trees are at the top of the tree, not at the bottom. Zillions of ants live in the canopy, including this really cute one, which has an abdomen that looks like a leaf. It's a fabulous camouflage. Not only is it camouflaged with its body looking like a leaf, but it even has a little tiny dark spot looking like a hole in the leaf, which is fantastic. Um, other things in the canopy include birds. Here's a frigate bird with this fabulous red balloon that it puffs up when it's trying to find a girlfriend. And these birds live in the mangroves of Florida, as well as many tropical islands like the Galapagos. Um, or you might find a koala in the canopy in Australia, or you might find millions and millions of beetles in the canopy all over the world, or maybe something wonderful like a red-eyed tree frog here in Belize. So with all of these species comes the responsibility to explore them, discover them, publish about them, explain them. And right now we don't have enough arbornauts to do all this work, which is amazing. One of my students became an expert on sloths. The sloth is a fabulous canopy leaf eater in Central America and South America. If you ever get to go there, it's an amazing species to observe. And um, yet others are really microscopic, like this creature. I wished I could interview all of you watching this webinar, but um, anybody know what this is? Give you a couple seconds to think about it. About 20 of them could fit on your little finger. That's how tiny they are. But this is a water bear. The technical name is tardigrade. The phylum is called tardigrada. And this crazy creature is one of the extreme organisms of the planet. It can live in hot springs. It lives in the ice in Antarctica. But most of all, it lives in any drop of water on the trunk of a tree, the leaves of a tree, the moss, the lichens, 
growing on the tree. So it's a fantastically amazing species in all of our rainforests around the world. And we are discovering new species every time we go to the rainforest because nobody's ever studied the treetops before. And this is a very new world, or as I called it, the eighth continent. So here's a little timeline, but in 1979, I actually sewed a harness from seatbelt webbing. I made a slingshot out of a piece of metal and welded it at the shop. It's in the university. I borrowed a rope and some metal hardware from the caving club that would allow me to use my rope to ascend up a tree. And so that's where the first Arbornauts were born. Soon afterward, I realized to myself, hey, it's not very fair if only one person can climb a tree at a time. A rope really only holds one person. If you put 10 people on a rope, it's kind of dangerous and you might even break it and fall. So I worked with an ecotourist lodge in Queensland, Australia, and we made the first canopy walkway, a treetop walk where dozens of people can go at the same time through the treetops and stop and pause and enjoy nature. So that was uh, basically toolkit number two. First, we have ropes and harnesses. Second, now we have canopy walkways. And third, we ended up with construction cranes for those very few places that have a good budget, such as Panama with the Smithsonian funding research down there. Um, we were able to erect a construction crane and every leaf, every iguana, every sloth within the arm of the crane could be monitored with this piece of equipment. Um, in 1992, I came back from Australia to North America and built the first canopy walkway in North America at Williams College where I was a professor. And at the same time, I took a little tiny, uh, you know, field trip and worked with some French scientists on the inflatables, another gadget, another tool in our toolkit to study the treetops. You can use the hot air balloon to measure oxygen and atmosphere, or you can use this amazing canopy raft, which alights and is tethered to the treetops so that we can study the very, very tippy tops of the trees at all points in time. And so coming back from Australia to North America, I ended up as the director of a botanical garden in Florida where I actually built the first public canopy walkway in North America down here in Sarasota, Florida. And this walkway, brings in about $30 million of revenue every year, a half a million visitors. And it's a fabulous way for families and kids to see the treetops, which they've never ever seen before. So it's been a big hit. And it actually inspired me for part of my book, which I'll talk about in a minute, a new project called Mission Green. Finally, I did find create a foundation to fundraise to build the canopy walkway because we needed donations from the public. And last but not least, I just wrote a book last year trying to talk about the stories of a girl tree climber and all the different forests we've saved and the methods we've devised and the kids that have worked with me and hopefully stories that will empower, inspire you to become a lover of trees and maybe even a person who wants to contribute to saving trees. So that's the book. And I think it's in the library in Illinois, which is fantastic. And here's a few little snippets about the book. One is I tried to tell the public something really important. You know what? Trees are worth money. They're not just a pretty thing in people's backyards. Trees do so many things for us. Even while we sleep, trees are giving us fresh water because it percolates through the canopy and cleanses out the toxins. Trees produce oxygen because the leaves release oxygen in their photosynthesis process. 
Trees give us timber and food and clothing and many, many cultures. Chocolate is a fabulous food. Oranges, cherries, think about it. So, so many foods come from trees. Trees conserve soil. This one sounds a little complex, but you know what? Be, the roots of trees actually hold water and prevent it from flushing downstream and into the ocean the way it does when land has been cleared. So it's really important to think about tree roots as this extraordinary device to keep our fresh water intact and recycling within the forest, not going out and becoming salt. Trees are home to half of the world species. This is huge. All of those pollinators, all of those amazing cures for cancer and different diseases are all parts of trees. An amazing array, and most of them we haven't even classified or identified yet. Wow. Trees store carbon because of treetop exploration. We now know that tree trunks store the carbon that is polluted by humans, which is really, really important. Trees also control climate with shade, with moisture, with amazing facilities to keep our lives much more pleasant. When you have trees in your neighborhood, you know that it feels better than being exposed to the bright sun in the sidewalks and nothing else to protect you from nature. And finally, two billion people in the world use trees for worship. They're critical in many African countries and Asian countries as the trees that give nourishment, give spiritual guidance are really, really important to the community. And even though we don't have a dollar sign for that, it's so, so critical that trees can contribute to human health. So here's a walkway in Malaysia. This is an exciting project as part of my recent Mission Green that I'll talk about in a minute, but we were able to fund a walkway here that in turn became a UNESCO World Heritage Site, which is fabulous because that means these forests are protected in perpetuity. So using the canopy to get people's attention and perhaps their contributions is a really, really fabulous thing. Um, I also use treetops to help girls and mentor women in science. Up in my little hometown in upstate New York, we have a Meg Laman treetops camp where girls like these get to learn to climb trees and it empowers them. Maybe they will become scientists. Maybe they'll just become brighter and bolder because they've conquered this amazing thing called tree climbing. And um, here's some third graders in my walkway in Sarasota, Florida, who actually discovered a new species of weevil just by making observations. So it shows you that any kid that goes to the treetops has the potential to really, really succeed. Some of my kids are bigger. Here are college students where I had a three-year grant every summer to take mobility limited kids and train them to climb trees. And guess what? They all discovered new species, water bears in this case, but how fabulous for a kid who thinks they might never go outdoors and be part of field biology to not only climb the trees, but also be part of the discovery of the biodiversity up there. And here they all are, climbing, climbing, even in oak trees and maple trees. We found new species of water bears in Kansas, in Ohio, in Illinois, in Massachusetts, places that you would never would realize had all of these mysterious things in the treetops, mostly because nobody had ever been there before. So let me segue to one of the chapters in the book, although the, the students, the mobility limited students were definitely a chapter in the book, but I tried to illustrate some different countries where forests are so endangered that you need to know the story, you need to understand what solutions are in place and pray with me a lot to hope that these solutions can be absolutely successful. So one of the most amazing stories is Ethiopia where the last remaining trees are in these little church forests. Here's the church around building in the middle. 
And the priests believe they are the stewards of all of God's creatures, as well as the human soul. So these priests have made a very big effort to save the trees on their campus. But outside of there is all subsistence agriculture. And even worse, in many cases, some of these little church forests are getting encroached by farmers who are plowing too close, by cattle who are coming in and feeding. And in this case, you can get a real sense of how these church forests are 3% of the Ethiopian landscape in Northern Ethiopia. So it's really, really urgent to save them. So I've been working there for almost 15 years, um, getting the trust of the priests, praying a lot, fundraising in the US so that we can build stone walls around these church forests to keep the cattle out and remind the farmers not to plow there. So this is a great example of how religion and science is coming together to save important forests. And in this case, I would give a lot of workshops to hundreds of priests, and in turn, they would ask their parishioners to donate the stones out of the field, which the farmers were so delighted to do, and they would build these fabulous walls around the church. And at the same time, we would try to educate the kids a little bit about their biodiversity. They became my best advisors and assistants for bug netting and, you know, any kind of tree climbing and finding of critters. So it was really, really exciting and fun to work with these kids in Ethiopia. So finally, I actually did write a children's book in Amharic, their native language, because these kids have no computers in school, no books, almost no pencils and paper. And so how can we help the next generation of priests and scientists in Ethiopia understand the importance of their trees? So I thought maybe writing a children's book in their own language with pictures from their own backyards would help them understand the importance of these church forests. So I've done that and I distribute these books. Every time you go on Amazon, if you buy Beza, my book about a girl who's tried to save the forests of Ethiopia, and you buy it on amazon.com in English, the cost, $20, actually funds the printing of a copy in Amharic which we then ship across to Ethiopia for kids. So I hope you might love this book and maybe select it in your library as well. Here it is, Beza in English, Beza in Amharic, and this little girl is a fictitious person, but trying to illustrate how maybe kids can be the progenitors of saving the forests of Ethiopia. So here are walls, it's fantastic. The farmers love it because they love to get the stones out of their fields. The priests love it because the walls protect the church forests and all the community people love it because now they have a beautiful church forest to worship in without any threat of closing down or shrinking or being eaten by cattle. And today you can go to Ethiopia and see these amazing walls surrounding these forests. I hope you will. And uh, maybe you can go online to www.treefoundation.org and even send a donation if you're interested in helping save the forests of this amazing country for, uh, oh my gosh, $500,000. We're actually saving the biodiversity of Ethiopia because the costs there are so relatively less expensive than advanced countries. And over time, we've started doing biodiversity surveys in these countries. National Geographic has been fabulous to support me in many ways um, so that we can start to understand the important medicines in these tree canopies, the important dyes, the important pollinators, all kinds of crazy and wonderful species in these forests of Ethiopia. But now we have a challenge and I wanna end up talking a little bit more about the last chapter of my book. The first chapters talk about Ethiopia and Malaysia and 
growing up as a geek child and going to college and struggling to do biology against the odds when everyone was male. Um, but right at the end of the book, I have a chapter called Mission Green because I want to really end on a note of hope. And the big challenge now is how can we protect against this amazing accelerating rate of deforestation? As I mentioned earlier, 50% of the world's forests have been lost in my lifetime. And the other 50% will be lost very shortly if we don't do something about it. So I started a project called Mission Green to globally promote tree conservation, economic stewardship, and STEM education partnering with all kinds of people, scientists, indigenous people, students, and philanthropists. And this is based on my dear friend, Sylvia Earle's project called Mission Blue, where 10 years ago, she started a project to champion conservation of hope spots in the ocean, which he has done a great job over the last 12 years. And I want to do something similar on land, which is why I call it Mission Green. And my best helper and mentor in this project has been um, an amazing biologist named Edward O. Wilson from Harvard University. Regretfully, he just died a month ago. But over the last two years, he really helped me shape this project called Mission Green, where he believed we could save forests through canopies, ecotourism, uh, in hiring women as guides, and maybe empowering students to come and do research in these canopy walkways. So this project, Mission Green, is now launched. You can go on the website, mission-green.org. You can look at our amazing advisory council with Peter Raven from Missouri and Alamaihu Wasi Ashete from Ethiopia, Pat Wright, the world's lemur expert, Ed Wilson, Sylvia Earle. We are so blessed to have fabulous intellectual capital, but now we have to turn that into absolute deliverables. And what we hope to do is we've identified the 10 most endangered force in the world, thanks to Edward O. Wilson in his book called Half Earth where he actually lists those very forests. So we're working on doing fabulous things in Florida and the Redwoods where walkways already exist, trialing new education methods. We're looking forward to designing and building canopy walkways in Madagascar and Mozambique. And we're looking to create local relationships in India and Bhutan to do special things that will lead to a canopy walkway there. So every country has a slightly different timeline because the trust of the local people is so critical and we have to really respect how we go in, how we present our activity and what we do in the end. It's like triage in a hospital emergency room, I was quoted to say, we must focus on saving the areas that make the biggest global difference. Starting with 10 critical forests, we can reverse species extinction and take giant steps toward a truly sustainable planet. So with that, I'd love to hear from you. If you're interested in Mission Green, I'd love you to share the book with girls as well as boys in science to help everybody understand the importance of trees. And um, I would love you to enjoy the book and hopefully write me if you have any questions or want to talk about how it is to be a pioneer exploring the treetops. So with that, um, those are my websites and I would love to turn it back to Patrick, who's going to, I think, lead us with a little bit of Q&A, which will be really great. So thank you so much everybody for staying awake and listening tonight, and I will stop the share. All right, um, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Okay, um, really we had a kind of an interesting question come in early on, and it is, um, is it known if water bears can survive in space? Oh yes, that's fantastic. So water bears are, or tardigrada, which is the phylum for water bears, are one of what we consider the most extremophile organisms on the planet. And kids love this. So a lot of times I really 
personally confess that I study water bears so that kids will enjoy thinking about the treetops, but water bears have been in space exploration. They've been shipped into outer space in one of those missions. I think it was led by India where it crashed. Uh, the water bears, of course, were, you know, smashed and released and maybe on the moon, if there's any water, we will have water bear colonies living. So they've actually gone to outer space, reproduced and come back and they live in hot springs. They live in Antarctic ice. So they are extraordinary extremophile organisms. Interesting. I didn't, I didn't know that. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, so oh, by the way, for my son's wedding gift, I named a species of water bear after him and his wife. You know, like most kids want a house or a down payment on a car, but I said, okay, this is your wedding gift. You have a new tardigrade named after you. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's what mom scientists do for their kids, right? Yeah, that's fun. So um, let's see. Here's one. Forests seem like such an impossibly vast landscape. Um, how do you design your studies? How Do you know which trees in a given forest you're going to examine? Or do you kind of, um, you know, yeah, I got, how, how do you design your studies? Yeah, that's a fabulous question and thanks for answering. And if anything, in my book, The Arbornaut, I felt a little nervous because the editors at Farash Ross and Drew kept saying, tell how you design your studies, give us the details. I feel a little worried that it might be over the head of some people, but I hope if you ask this question, you will read the book and tell me your opinion. Because in my case, I was in Australia, I had to pick out what were the kinds of rainforests. Then I had to pick out what were the representative trees. Then I had to think about what were the representative leaves that I was interested in because maybe bugs eat some kinds and not others. And then I had to figure out how to sample them all at different heights in the tree. So it becomes a statistical equation, basically number of sites, number of species, number of heights, number of even ages of leaves. It's a crazy world in science where you have to just, oops, are you still there? Yep. Um, oh, good. Anyway, so I, I just found that amazingly frustrating, but challenging. And that's the whole issue in ecology that you have this vast forest, you have to narrow the question down, you have to pick replication of either species or heights or sites. And so I hope you'll enjoy that part of the book because I just worry that it might have been too technical, but I'm glad you asked that question because maybe that means people would like to know more about it. Okay. All right, um, here's a good one. Um, while up in a balloon raft or um, like a canopy walkway, did you ever have any frightening moments or close calls or anything like that? All the time. I mean, the first time I climbed on a rope, I was scared out of my wits because I was sure the branch would break. Um, <laughs> and a little bit in every method is a little bit of danger because you're, let's face it, humans have to suffer gravity, right? We can't float if something breaks. We have to be really super careful. With the hot air balloon, the biggest fear was if winds came up and it swirled around and the driver would lose control. So we always had that issue and we tried to fly our expeditions very early in the morning before the prevailing winds came up. With canopy walkways, it's mostly safe. That's probably the safest method I would recommend, but there's always the worry of termites coming up. And if the walkways are connected by trees, you have to check very frequently to make sure termites have not made your tree support their desserts, you know, so we do have to keep track of that. Yikes. Okay. Um, so here's one. Um, National Geographic recognizes you as a change maker, an innovator, and community builder. What is it like um, having been captivated by National Geographic as a student only to grow up and have your research funded by them and, and have them honor you in this way. 
Oh, what a sweet question. Thanks for asking. And it was true. Like a lot of people probably in the audience, I read those magazines when I was a kid and I really respected the fact that they were trying to demystify nature for most of us. So it is, of course, a real thrill to work with them and do good. I'm I'm one of their like poster childs for the kids magazine this summer. They have some new kids programs and I get to be a poster child for the kids. And I think to myself, you know, if I were a kid, when I was a kid, I would have loved to read about girl scientists. So I'm really happy that they're doing the kind of things they're doing and keep track because May issue is all about trees and uh, they're going to have some features. And I think I might be another part of that magazine, but I think it's great that they're trying to recognize that, you know, explorers who study trees are really important. To be honest, most people recognize people who study dolphins or primates and you know, Jane Gullall is a great friend and so is Randy Wells and a lot of the other people in the marine world. But it's really wonderful when people recognize that trees are so essential for our lifestyle because they're not as sexy as animals that hoop and holler and, you know, jump through, you know, different kinds of fire wheels at Disney World. But trees are so, so important to our daily lives. Indeed. Okay, here's an, uh, another one. Um, in a certain sense, you've discovered a new kind of science. Um, canopy ecology, is that, that would be the, the term. Um, and there are very few people in history who share that distinction. Are you ever able to step back from that, not as a scientist, but as a person and marvel at how unique that is? Uh, thanks for asking. You know, I do on occasion, I must admit rare occasions, but it is true that I wrote the definitive textbooks. I wrote the methodology book. I designed most of the methods. So in some senses, yes, I did design a new science. It's kind of interesting to me because I still think it's challenging to be a woman in science. I think there's a little less recognition for a woman who started a canopy science compared to a man who might have gone to outer space. Um, I think we're still, you know, looking at a few biases along the way, but I'm really, really proud of the fact that most of all that I've mentored a lot of students that can be canopy scientists, whereas I had to struggle to make the methods and fight the battles and perhaps pave the way for them to be successful. Great. Okay, um, so here's one. This is, uh, as I said, that this program is funded by um, the humanities grant. So we have a kind of a humanities question here. So we're gonna kind of go deep with this question. Um, you built a bridge with a Coptic religious community in Ethiopia. And in a certain sense, you, you share ecological goals with them. Trees are obviously a powerful symbol in many of the world's religions and mythologies. The mystery of trees seems to resonate, especially with children, which is maybe why children climb them. Why, why do you think humanity has such a deep affinity for trees? Oh my gosh, I, that's a great question. Thank you. Of course, I'm very biased, but I think, you know, trees are the provider of life. And I think Everywhere I go, especially Asia, uh, India, Africa, trees are this incredible spiritual icon. And I think because if you think about it, the role of a tree, it's providing water and shade and home for millions of creatures and good soil. And it's even for the leaf litter is helping you feed your crops with fertilizer. So trees are providing this incredible nourishing environment. And so I think it only goes to say that they would become spiritual icons. And that is fantastic. I think if only more countries viewed trees the same way that they do in Ethiopia or India or some other countries, if Americans viewed trees as spiritual icons, maybe we wouldn't be looking at all of these trees cut down in Florida and 
places like that where it's very, very disappointing. Maybe we wouldn't be looking at Brazil and Peru losing the Amazon because people might think of them as spiritual entities. So there is a real dichotomy between different cultures, but in those cultures where trees are spiritual and important as we know they are, they are far advanced from so many other countries because they are saving this extraordinary biological culture. And I will also add as a person who maybe kind of pioneered the work between religion and science in the Ethiopian case, I say to other colleagues that a lot of research needs trust. It doesn't need data and it doesn't need computers and it doesn't need fancy cameras or people using big words. It needs you to go there and build the trust with the local people. And so for me, building trust with the Ethiopian priests and praying with them and eating lamb in the middle of the forest with them and, you know, kind of sharing our love of the trees meant so much to them to allow me the privilege of helping them save their forests. And I don't say that lightly because, you know, to try to be a Westerner going and educate people is not an easy thing to do. And you have to be awfully careful not to be viewed as a colonialist, but building trust is so important in science. And unfortunately, most graduate schools don't train students to build trust in their field research. And I think they should. Okay. Um, so uh, here's a question and I, I, um, I, I find it interesting. I think um, uh, any children are viewing this, they may also, but um, you're frequently pictured wearing what can only be described as explorer gear. Um, I think I actually saw you do a TED talk and you were wearing like, you were wearing like field gear. Um, can you describe some of the field gear you take um, up, oh, into the canopy with you? Sure, I'd be happy to. <laughs> you just lost your lights, but I can keep talking. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, to be practical, I wear khakis because they're lightweight. I wear long pants just because it minimizes any bug bites. And I have a vest that allows me to put lots of things in the pockets. And I usually have a little rucksack or backpack that gives me the chance to load all my gear and water and Oreo cookies or whatever I need to sustain myself. So it is, there is a certain look. Now, you know what, if I worked on Wall Street, I'd be wearing a suit, right? If I worked in, uh, uh, you know, in a, as a chef, I'd be wearing a hat and an apron. So I guess the get garb for a field scientist is trying to figure out what's the best thing to wear for the conditions. And when I give talks to students in particular, I tend to wear that gear because that's what they've seen me in books. That's where they've seen me in videos. And I just kind of do that for fun. Um, I'm not wearing it tonight. I actually have a little bit of a dress on because I was at an event giving a, a, a book reading earlier here in Florida. But I think, you know, sometimes it's just trying to make sure that kids understand as a role model, I want to present to them what I do. And I think if I were to show up with a evening gown, it might be a little bit of a double standard. They would say like, what on earth is she doing? <laughs> okay. Um, okay, this is a, here's a good one. Um, you coined the term, uh, as far as I know, glass canopy in Arbor Knot which refers to um, the invisible barrier preventing women from rising above a certain level in the scientific community. Um, is, is there a unique perspective that women bring to the sciences in your opinion? And what would you say to girls who uh, may be watching this who are like discern discerning a similar career? Sure, you know, and I did use that word glass canopy because um, Cheryl Sandberg, who worked, I think, for Facebook or somewhere, had this glass ceiling thing where women couldn't advance in the technology world. And I 
after all my decades of career, I finally had the courage to write about that in this book. And that's 45 years after a lot of those events happened. I never would have dared write about that earlier in my career, which is a little embarrassing and disappointing. And I'm not proud of that fact, but I think, you know, I, I'm sort of at the point in life where if I could help other girls do better by hearing about my challenges, then I feel that's worthwhile. But I would have been really scared to write about that 10 years ago, I'm embarrassed to admit. Um, so having done that, um, I think it's super, super important to know that it still is challenging to be a girl in science. It's challenging to be a minority in science in many ways. And why should we care? Well, there's enough data now from National Science Foundation and even from my own personal experiences to say, you know what, getting a diverse point of view at the table, the decision-making table for conservation is really important. How can we make conservation decisions without the indigenous people, without the moms, without the tribal chiefs? So we need to be really super um, conscious of bringing diversity to our decision-making opportunities. And there are many, many studies that have showed how important that is. And for me, in personally, I've been amazed at how many times I've been the only woman on an expedition, but the tribal chiefs gravitated to me. They trusted me. They loved my pictures of my children. There were, I contributed unique things to the expedition that didn't have to do with climbing the tree the fastest or being the strongest or being the one that could drink the most whiskey or whatever it was at the end of the day. I think being a, the one of the few women actually promoted that level of trust with the locals. And so I think there's a lot of importance for getting more women in field biology. And I sure hope my book can contribute to that. Great. Okay, um, here's one. Um, did did your sons ever have a sense that their mom was a trailblazer when they were young? Were they aware of how truly innovative your work is, or did they think that um, everyone's mom went on overnight expeditions and the <laughs> uh, canopy with koalas? That's a great question. Thank you for asking that. You know, I don't think my sons probably knew that. The one, the coolest thing they thought when they were little is we had a pet tarantula and every kid in the school wanted to come over and watch the tarantula when we fed it the cricket once a month. They huh. thought like this house was very cool. We had blow guns, we had tarantulas, we had masks from native tribes. So that was kind of cool. But I don't think they probably knew that until they were a little older. And now as we look back, um, we did write a book together called It's a Jungle Up There with Yale University Press where I wrote about some of my expeditions and they wrote, they gave little journal entries about how it was to be with their mom in these different places. And I think, and that was, we we published that when they were in high school, even though the journal entries were from an age about five to 16, but I think they started to figure out, you know what, our life was different. Yeah. <laughs> and um, so, but I do appreciate that question because I think it's harder for kids when they're young to know, you know, that they're really doing something that's really wild and crazy. And I appreciate my boys, as you know, I've dedicated a couple of my books to them because I think they helped me retain a sense of wonder. I think kids can be really useful for my scientific career to remind me about all the coolness of nature and not just get bogged down with the data. Yeah, great. Okay, uh, here's one. Um, even though we sometimes speak of the unity of science, are there any scientific disciplines outside of ecology or terrestrial terrestrial studies that fascinate you? Oh, like that's, yeah. that's a great question. You know, I love actually the cooking. I'm fascinated by the <laughs> chemistry of cooking. In my next life, I would be a chef maybe. And I love architecture. I love thinking about how trees grow, for example, but how it could relate to the physics and the science of how we build things. And I've actually been a consultant 
for the chief architect of Barcelona, which is a city in Spain where this architect named Gaudi based everything on trees. So I've been over there a few times to lecture to all the students who study trees as this iconic element of architecture. So I guess a lot of my interest in other scientists and other fields and other sciences is maybe a little bit stemming from trees, but what's amazing is they all are, there are so many diverse fields and we need to think about that. And if I were to advise a student, I'd also say, take economics, because I wished I had been able earlier in my career to tell you the value of a tree in dollars and cents. You know, I think Americans need to know that better. So we need to link these diverse sciences into our tree science if we ever can. Okay. It uh, looks like there's another one um, that came through. Um, uh, did the Ethiopian priest speak English or did you need a, an interpreter? Yes, so I have a fabulous colleague in Ethiopia who is uh, was a young student that I helped sponsor early in his career uh, because he was the only student studying the biodiversity of trees in Ethiopia. So we developed a great partnership and he has moved on in his career as you hope every student will and now has responsibilities and trust. And he works really beautifully well with the priests as well as the scientists. And so the two of us are a team. He, uh, he's my brother, basically. We are brother and sister and we do this work together and he translates. The priests understand the language of plants. They un we talk about the medicinal uses. We talk about the bugs we collect. We communicate in these really wonderful ways that represent trust. But he sets up the meetings. He translates when I give a presentation to the priests. He translates it into the Amharic and the children's book that I've written recently in Amharic is obviously translated by him and not by me because I wouldn't have the wherewithal to do that. So it's a very much a team uh, play. And I think for every country that I've worked in, I always have to have local collaboration to be successful. It's never possible as an English speaking Westerner to go in and really do good without the trust of some local people. Okay. Um, okay. Uh I think two more. Um, Arbornot is a kind. It's a kind of scientific biography. Um, as a reader, are there are there other scientific biographies or me memoirs uh, that you've enjoyed? Uh, are there any in particular that maybe influence uh, your writing of Arbornot? Oh, that's such a nice question. Um, you know what surprised me is there's almost no biographies by field biologists. I'm a real field biologist. I loved the biography of Rachel Carson, who was a lady in the 1950s that discovered DDT killed birds. Oh. And yet her biographies are sort of clinical and they're not written by her, they're written by other people. And I also had as a role model, a lady named Harriet Tubman, who took slaves through the Underground Railway by feeling moss in the dark on the north side of the tree. And I read her biography in seventh grade and I just adored her forever and ever. And I thought to myself, I would love to be a naturalist like her because I viewed her as this quintessential naturalist. Um, so there are very few women memoirs. That's kind of the disappointing thing. I love reading Bob Ballard's memoir. I love reading Jacques Cousteau's memoir. And I'm pri privileged to have Jane Goodall as a friend and have read her memoirs. So there are a few women smattered amongst mostly men. Um, but anyway, so those might give you a little bit of a, I guess, a diversity of the things. I read voraciously whenever I hear such a thing is out there. And maybe they're becoming a little more common, I think. You know, technically scientists don't get rewarded for writing a memoir. You only get promoted if you write a technical publication about your data. And so that's why I think there's not so many memoirs by scientists as there might be as 
say, artists or politicians, for example. So maybe that will change. Okay. Um, okay, so last last question. You did, I think you did mention architecture, um, but if you weren't an Arbonaut, if you weren't a, a scientist, uh, what else do you think you might do for a living? So I would, of course, I've been a teacher as a, you know, Arbonaut. I, I love teaching and I love students, but I would probably be a chef or an architect. I love cooking. I love cooking for my kids and my friends and my family. And I love the chemistry of cooking. And I do love architecture, thinking about those trees and how those branches go out and how, you know, we look at support structures and buildings. And now I think more than ever, it's really important to think about sustainable architecture, sustainable cooking. I just taught an online course about sustainable fashion. Think about it, all the water and resources that it takes to produce cotton versus polyester versus nylon. So I think we're at a point in time where we need to really be thinking about careers that can bring sustainability home, not just in the ones I love like cooking and architecture, but maybe in many other places like fashion brands or transportation or other things. So I'm excited to see what kids decide to do. And I just hope they'll do it with a vision of taking good care of planet earth. Great. Um, I, I, I really enjoyed um, your presentation and our conversation tonight. Um, is there anything else you wanted to share with the audience? Um, I guess I just, just say in closing that I, I hope you'll enjoy the book and particularly the last chapter where I talk about Mission Green. I really want to bring hope to children and families and say that maybe together we can save the forests of the world. And I want to make a big shout out to get more girls in science, but as the mother of boys, I think we need boys in science too. So more diversity and um, really devoting time and energy and funds to save trees, not just maybe to buy tickets to Disneyland, even though I live in Florida, so bite my tongue. But, you know, I think we it's time has come that we just need to look after our heritage, which is really the forest of the planet. So I hope people will appreciate and um, maybe follow that kind of guideline for their families. And thanks so much for having me as one of your speakers. Well, it's our pleasure, and I just want to just remind everybody that to respond to Ryan's survey, and we're going to be giving away a brand new copy of Canopy Meg's book, uh, The Arbornaut. So uh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Okay. Take care for the right. trees. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great night.